Good morning. This is uh, Dr. Dale Miles from Fountain Hills, Arizona in my study where I read all my scans. I want to thank the, uh, the organization for the invitation to speak to you today. This is the 23rd uh, annual meeting of the ICD-MFR and I think I've only spoken at uh, maybe one before this. So uh, my topic is uh, I think going to be of great interest to radiologists here um, and around the world. Um, it comes after many years of following uh, calcifications in uh, vessels, uh, and I'll, I'll have uh, an outline for that from the beginning. So my title is Detection of Undiagnosed Type 2 Diabetes Mellitus on Cone Beam CT Images, and I want to again thank the committee for the invite. So I've been following uh, calcifications for quite a long time, uh, probably since 1981 or two. And one of the first papers that intrigued me was the original report by Friedlander and Land on the panoramic identification of arterial plaques. And they called them diffuse sclerotic plaques. Uh, I call them the infamous <laughs> sclerotic plaque. So, we, we all started looking for these. We all instructed our dental colleagues to look in the oral pharyngeal airway, uh, sort of delineate these plaques from other normal anatomic structures. When I was still a resident in 1983, um, I was rotating through the Audi Murphy Veterans Hospital and they had 3,300 discarded panoramic films and I was looking for good um, teaching material, uh, panoramic errors and anatomy and other things that I could make slides from for my uh, educational career when I left my program. And when we uh, looked at this, these panoramic films, I found 13 cases of uh, Monkberg's calcinosis, the type of tram track or, or railroad track uh, I, uh, appearance of someone that had Monkbergs. And I pulled the charts and lo and behold, uh, you know, most of the people in this particular group of the, the 13 that had uh, Monkbergs calcifications on the panoramics had heart problems, hypertension, um, a couple even were recorded as atherosclerosis. Uh, three of them, however, were recorded as having uh, diabetes mellitus. And most of them also had chronic renal failure. So these were sick individuals. Um, their particular calcifications were quite far along. So I actually wrote uh, Dr. Friedlander and I said, hey, I've, I've got some other calcifications that look interesting and I found all these systemic conditions related to them. So I started looking. This is one of the cases. This gentleman came in for the extraction of a painful lower left second molar. Uh, you can see there's no bone support. This tooth was extracted. They didn't do anything with the other one at the time. But I did a little bit of image processing, and at the time that consisted of putting it on a view box and changing the rheostat. And lo and behold, I actually came up with these calcified arteries. You can see them bilaterally, uh, which ended up being facial arterial calcifications of the Monkberg's type. You can see them here. Along came more image processing tools over the years, and I tried embossing and inversion, and you can see that these particular calcifications show up extremely well um, with uh, a high-pass filter basically applied to the, the film-based image. But uh, other people came along, and I learned some things from my friends Bill Scarf and Alan Farman that when you see these calcifications, you should apply a MIP tool, a maximum intensity projection tool. And they were showing on this particular article in this uh, AADMRT newsletter, all of the types of calcifications that would be more identifiable if you applied an MIP filter. So in 2005, when I left academia and started into a full time of private practice, I had some exquisite software. I had the uh, earlier versions of the CyberMed On Demand 3D and that particular software had very simple intuitive tools uh, to get to the endpoint to make the calcifications visible. 
So I applied the MIP tool to any calcifications and I started coming up with a pattern, uh, especially in the internal carotid artery segments, either the cervical segments or more importantly to me, up in the uh, cella tersica region, up in the segments of the ICA or internal carotid artery that were cavernous ophthalmic and clinoid segments. And that's what I'm going to show you. So when you apply a MIP tool to a carotid plaque, a diffuse sclerotic carotid plaque, this is what it looks like. However, when you apply the same tools, a MIP tool to calcifications that you see that I know are in the internal carotid artery, at least unilaterally, and they don't look diffuse and sclerotic, they look circular, they can look curvilinear, they can look linear depending on the plane of section. So we were able to see these original um, cases or, or images that were called plaques uh, as something different. So you apply your pattern matching kind of uh, goggles and you end up uh, saying, hey, I think I can make these stand out. So this is the same patient uh, a little lower down and you can see a, another circular kind of calcification in the patient's right internal carotid in the cervical segment. And if we apply the MIP tool, you can see that indeed it's bilateral. Well, if something's bilateral, it's often systemic. And when I see it in one location of an artery, I start looking in the other locations. So at a 0.1 millimeter section, you'll see these thin uh, circular or curved curvilinear um, um, calcifications in the axial plane. When you apply the MIP tool, I usually do it at 10. I've done it at 5 as well, but they always end up showing the calcifications much more distinctly. So, yes, that's a carotid plaque, and it's the, the buildup is in the tunica intima, the lumen of the layer, uh, the luminal uh, uh, portion of the arteri artery. But MAC, medial arterial calcification, is in the next layer. It's in the tunica media, and so it's in the muscular layer, the layer that has to be compliant when demands are put upon it. It has to expand and contract, and if you lose that compliance uh, in a systemic disease like diabetes, then other things shut down. Because remember, we're seeing these at the macroscopic level, but all of this has been happening for probably many years at the microscopic level. That's why diabetics get peripheral neuropathies and kidney problems, first organ system to shut down. So I believe that this pattern of calcification, uh, as well as the, the circular and linear patterns, are much more significant. And when you see them, you owe it to the patient to, first of all, find out if they are diabetic and diagnosed or if they're controlled or if they don't know that they're diabetic and, and order or recommend the appropriate test to, to simply prove that. So when you have a plaque, the buildup uh, of the lipids are in, deposited in the uh, intimal wall. They build up, they do cause some stenosis, but it, that's not what kills the patient. What kills the patient is when the fibers cap on one of these lesions ruptures and uh, a blood clot or sometimes even a little piece of calcification will migrate through the vascular system, end up in the heart area or the brain area and cause heart problems or stroke. So with the Monkbergs type, and I'm calling these Monkbergs because it's not the train track or tramway uh, version, but it still is around an arterial wall. So I think what we saw early on and called Monks, Monkbergs is a very severe endpoint for that particular vascular system where the earlier calcifications are uh, of the patterns that I'm showing you and will show you more of. So the calcification is this very dense staining area in the, in the medial, the tunica media, and that's why I term it, or I call it as most other people do in North America, medial arterial calcinosis or MAC. So I want you to think about plaque versus MAC, and I want to tell you I've got about 300 cases of each, and it's almost an equal distribution of each when I, in the cases that I've seen, and I've read over 30,000 uh, cone beam scan reports to date. So here's a case, and you can see there are circular calcifications. The, the carotid artery can run in aberrant pathways. This one happens to run through the posterior pharyngeal wall. So that would be important to know if you were planning surgery back there. You wouldn't want the patient to exsanguinate because of tonsillectomy. 
Obviously, they're not probably getting their tonsils out at that stage. But in any event, you can see that it is bilateral. They're curvilinear or circular. When we look at this same patient up in the area of the sphenoid sinus, cella turcica, you're looking at circular and curvilinear patterns for the uh, internal carotid artery in the cavernous and also probably ophthalmic segments. Uh, and I'll show you that anatomically. We'll see how important that is. If you are looking axially up in this area, you, you sometimes see very linear type calcification. And this is where the artery is. It's come up from inferiorly, it's going forward, and it's going to go up again or bend back on itself. So you're going to see linear patterns as well in different planes. The sagittal plane is one of those planes that we see it uh, linearly. You can see this is actually outlining the walls of the internal carotid artery as it comes up through the cavernous uh, component, uh, the temporal bone, and then curves forward past the clinoid process and into the ophthalmic portion. So these are very significant calcifications that you should not miss. And when you see them in the thin slice uh, presentation, you should always apply the MIP tool. To me, this pattern, uh, and I see this a lot, okay, this pattern uh, basically is pathognomonic. This is medial arterial calcification earlier than the, the full-blown Monkberg's, but still of the Monkberg's type. It's in the medial, uh, the tunica media of the artery. And you can see I put some anatomic uh, things on there. I actually do this for my clients as well because I'm educating them, uh, as well as the physicians that end up with these reports that it's not just arteriosclerotic plaques anymore, that we have to distinguish between the two. So these are not normal and they're not diffuse sclerotic plaques. These are, um, have certain patterns and they're, they're highly, highly suggestive of an undiagnosed or uncontrolled type 2 diabetes mellitus. And by the time they get to this stage, these people might also be on their way to end stage renal disease. So plaques are mostly solitary and disorganized and they purport arteriosclerosis and we worry about hypertension and stroke. MAC is multiple locations. It comes in patterns, linear, curvilinear, and circular. And it's more, uh, most often uh, associated with diabetes, kidney disease, and eventually below the knee amputation. And it's not just me that's been looking at this. I have a stack of literature that's now helping me confirm all the things I had my suspicions about over all these years. I even tried to get my graduate students in Indiana to uh, help me with uh, some protocols to, to figure out why we were seeing these calcifications. But um, although initially MAC was considered a, a, a sort of a, a frequent finding but didn't have any um, sort of uh, impact, now it's seen as a strong predictor of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, especially in diabetic patients. So I want you to look for these types of calcifications, these linear types uh, lining the arterial wall, um, circular or curvilinear types lining the vessel wall in the uh, internal carotid segments up by the cella. You will also see that this patient is very well along. This MIP image shows how thickly calcified the medial layer is. And here's our friend Monkberg's down in here in the uh, uh, cervical or facial possibly artery uh, down in this region. In 2008, there was a wonderful article, and this I embed in all the times I make a citation and, and ask the, uh, the cl referring clinician to make a referral. I always put this picture in, this actual JPEG, along with the description of MAC. And this is out of the British Journal Circulation, and you can see that they called things slightly different. Um, calcific atherosclerosis, it's in the intimal layer, okay? It is a calcification. And what you worry about basically is hypertension and stroke. Calcific medial vasculopathy, or what we're calling medial arterial calcification, or Monkberg's and various stages, is in the tunica media. And you have to worry about or you have to think about type 2 diabetes mellitus, end stage renal disease, and amputation. So that's plaque, and that's MAC. I think there's as much or more MAC out there. I just think we haven't been separating the two, and it's about time we did.
So I've been publishing this. I mean, I, I know that there's been some articles out there. I got kind of, uh, uh, kind of annoyed with some of the people that didn't cite some of these articles, but some of them aren't in journals that radiologists read all the time. Uh, first time I put it in, however, was in my the first edition of my textbook, my Atlas, in 2008. So it's been around for a while, and there are beautiful examples in there. I put it in uh, the seminars of orthodontics as uh, sort of a, a description of a lot of different occult pathology, a pathology you're not expecting. 2011, I did a, for Orthotown, which is more of a, a clinician supplement. I did a two-part series, the second part of which described MAC. Uh, Bob Danforth and I edited the 2014 Dental Clinics of North America all on comb beam and our chapter featured um, all the systemic changes and had a, a number of really nice examples of medial arterial calcification. And then most recently um, I was asked to help out with a risk um, supplement or risk uh, uh, issue of the Journal of the Canadian uh, California Dental Association. Uh, September 2019, and we put some cases in there. The risk being the risk to the doctor of missing this and, and possibly uh, harm coming to the patient and the doctor being sued. So this is in the textbook, the two editions of the textbook. You can see curvilinear uh, or circular calcification here, and we actually had multiple examples of this, including um, full 3D color surface renderings. In the uh, orthodontic supplement, I put some, some of these calcifications that I'm showing you today. I've got so many cases, I can't show you them all. But these circular uh, components here and here, and these are in the cavernous segments of the uh, internal carotid artery. And then this is a case that, uh, one of the cases that Juan and I put in, uh, Dr. Ipez and myself, showing these circular calcifications in the ophthalmic segment uh, sorry, the cavernous segment, curvilinear in the ophthalmic, and this actually thickened out in the MIP image, and at the same time showing circular calcifications in the uh, cervical component uh, in the neck. So the patterns, curvilinear, circular, circular, linear. These are what you're looking for in the various segments of the internal carotid artery that we see in the head and neck region. Just to remind you, uh, after it branches in the neck at C3, C4, the, the internal carotid comes up. There are several segments that are basically identified. This is a very uh, common classification for these uh, segments. And where I see the calcifications most often is in cavernous, clinoid, and ophthalmic. So the fourth, fifth, and sixth segments. And that would correspond to this region of the uh, internal carotid. Okay. So I'm looking for calcifications in the ophthalmic region and the clinoid and cavernous segments. And by the way, this, as we all know, this artery comes up very close to the temporomandibular joint condyle in, in our coronal planes of section, so dentists are going to see this too. Um, I usually thicken to 10 millimeters. Uh, sometimes you don't even have to. This is a 0.1. Uh, a thin section showing lots of segments that are involved. I had to thicken this one out to point uh, to five millimeter thickness, a half a centimeter to show the outline of the artery. Dentists think they're not going to see this, but if you, you and I know as radiologists that this is the condylar head, so if they take any view, any field of view that captures the condyle, they're going to see these calcifications. And I'll show you a small field of view example in a little bit. Uh, again, uh, I, for my clients, sometimes I even label the anatomy because I'm afraid they'll think, well, is that a, a you know, calcification around the arterial wall as well? Um, we all know that these are the arteries and these are the anterior clinoid uh, processes. So this is what you're looking for. Uh, in a cartoon of this particular region, you can see the pituitary gland and the stalk. You can see the sphenoid sinus down here. The artery comes from below. It curves medially and then passes through the foramen lacerum and makes a bend right in the area beside the pituitary fossa. And so these are the areas that I see medial arterial calcification in all the time. There have been some very good papers. These uh, friends of mine, uh, Erwin and Paul and 
Costas, they published along with uh, two of their colleagues a very nice paper, but they still just said uh, there's an association between extra and intracranial calcifications in the internal carotid. And yes, there are, but the, the only thing they discussed in here was looking at it for arteriosclerosis. Well, this is not, when you see it there in the images that they show, just arteriosclerosis. This is actually medial arterial calcification, MAC here, MAC here, MAC here. So this is a diabetic. They just didn't put two and two together. So I give them, they identified the segments we're going to see them in. They did a beautiful paper, um, but the target's been moving. Everybody used to say that there was no real significance to Monkberg's. Well, we're finding out that earlier on, we're going to see changes in the arterial uh, wall, the, the tunica media. So the target's been changing. So with uh, deference to my friends here, um, you get an A for effort, but you, you miss the systemic disorder that is responsible of these patterns of calcifications. So we're too focused on plaque. Um, we're just too focused on it. And I think it's part and parcel with following the medical profession and looking at all the you know, the uh, ads for, for medications to reduce plaque in the inner layer of arteries that's going to kill you. The plaque doesn't kill you. The, the, you can have 90% of your arterials, uh, your artery lumens closed off and, and live till you're 100. But if you throw a small piece, you can stroke out or you can have a, an MI. So it's, it's the, we have to learn to differentiate between the two. I convinced my neuroradiologist friend and colleague, Chris Smith, who comes to our international, our, our national meeting uh, about once every other year, um, about this, and we ended up publishing in the American Society of Head and Neck Radiology uh, electronic abstract that's, that looked at the patterns of these calcifications, and we proposed that it was an you know, a possible marker of undiagnosed or uncontrolled type 2 diabetes mellitus, and that was in October of 2019. Um, other people, this is published right on Harvard's uh, website, they're saying that, you know, traditionally we looked at the obstruction of the lumen of the artery and we called it stenosis and everybody was going to die of a heart attack, but now we're finding that uh, it could be any of these little uh, plaques along the, along the wall of the artery and they don't even have to be calcified and you can still end up having a, a heart cardiac or a, a stroke event. So in, in their uh, information on that site, they basically said the majority of ruptures originate from non-obstructive plaques that do not cross the 50% threshold, because 50% was kind of the, the stage at which most of the neurosurgeons wanted to do, or the surgeons wanted to do, uh, endarterectomy. And when they go in to do that, there's a, as big a likelihood of throwing a piece of clot or plaque and, and stroking out just from the procedure. So I want you to look, I'm gonna have about six or seven cases, and I want you to watch where these uh, calcifications occur. Uh, in the thin slice, in this first case, you can see a little linear pattern here, some uh, curvilinear shape here. But as we uh, applied our MIP tools, you can see kind of a circular form here, another curved form here. Um, this particular case, I went and I, I tried to reconstruct panoramics to see if I could see anything in the in the uh, cervical components. This is at 30 or 35 millimeter slice thickness with a MIP image and we can't see anything. It's only when we malposition patients in panoramics and we get them too far forward that the carotid plaques in the cervical components start to be visible. But this patient, the one I just showed you, had a medical history with known diabetes and they also had hypertension because they were on lisinopril, and a statin. So they were on a, a lipid reducing agent, um, a blood pressure agent, they already had diabetes and the only thing that we saw were these calcifications. The next case that I'm going to show you is in a small field of view. This is uh, one of those machines that you're, you push something on the, inner, the GUI, the graphic user interface, and select two TMJ views and that the robotics and the machine make it happen. So here's a curvilinear uh, calcification up here by the pituitary area, um, a little further up and then and basically applying a MIP tool. You can see these are very distinct 
uh, uh, calcifications, linear and curved. These are not diffuse sclerotic plaques. If we turn this patient and look coronally, you can see in a thin slice, we see a circular pattern. And when we applied the MIP tool, we see that it's bilateral. So even in this uh, relatively small field of view, just of the condyles, uh, we're going to see these, these types of problems. And this lady, also by her medical history, she had blood, whatever that meant, blood pressure. She had blood pressure, heart and diabetes. So she had high blood pressure, I'm sure, cardiac uh, problems, and also type 2 diabetes. Uh, third case, you can again see the segments that are involved. The clinoid processes stand out really nicely. So this is ophthalmic. This is cavernous segment, um, possibly happening over here as well. I put the arrows on for my clients to try and educate them. When we do the MIP, it wasn't uh, much more distinct, but we start to see at least some pattern and not just a big lump of calcification. In the axial plane of view, you can see it showing up bilaterally and maybe looking a little circular or curvilinear here. And then when we put it in the sagittal view, you almost get an idea that it's outlining the artery. And then when we applied the MIP tool, now these could look like diffuse sclerotic plaques, but um, in this patient, it's in multiple locations in the arteries that uh, I'm convinced the patient's diabetic. Well, they weren't diabetic in, according to their history, but they were taking uh, several medications, and this is one that we've referred off, and I'll show you how we make the referral. We don't just want to confirm from the history that they have diabetes. That makes me feel good. But if we see these calcifications like we see here, we want to make sure that the patient gets the appropriate follow-up because the, phys the physician community has missed this diagnosis. All right, so here's case four, 72-year-old white male. I see calcifications. They don't look that distinct. Little curved pattern here, little linear pattern here. We put the MIP tool on, and you can see they're much more distinct at this point. By the way, this is a small uh, cortical osteoma in the ethmoid air cell complex. But when we turn it uh, in the coronal plane of section, you can see they are very distinctly circular or curvilinear. So I'm convinced, again, this is a patient with diabetes. And when we put the MIP tool on in this one, man, it's, it's lining a huge portion of the, the lining of the wall in the tunica media. On the uh, sagittal view, you can see the outline of the, of the vessel here and the MIP image confirming that, you know, there's a lot of change going on in that vessel wall. In this particular case, you can see here's that little cortical osteoma. We actually, in the thin slice, see it better, and it, it looks like the arteries coming up, curving forward, and then making its curve in past the clinoid process. But in the neck, it just looked like a small diffuse sclerotic plaque. So if you only saw this, you'd quit, you know, your whole uh, uh, interpretation. But if you saw this and this together, you got to start thinking diabetes. So here's a, a larger view. I'm just showing you where the artery would be. And if you look, that's exactly where the vessel is going. So in my, in my recommendations, what I say um, after I've done the report and made all my images and I start to compile the report, when I, when I describe it, I'll say there are circular calcifications or whatever the shape are in the carotid arteries in the segments, in this case the ophthalmic segments suggestive of MAC, and then I define it. And then I say, seen an undiagnosed type 2 diabetes mellitus. But I don't leave it at that. In the recommendation, I say, they should be referred for hypertension, stroke, and diabetes, and that the evaluation should include serologic levels of hemoglobin A1c. This is a simple test, easy to do. When you start making this recommendation and doing your follow-up, you're going to find that you have diagnosed a lot more diabetics from your cone beam scans. This is uh, the patient, and this is his follow-up, um, one of the sleep docs that sends me a lot of uh, clients. A lot of them are, are older, and a lot of them are ill, and you can see that the, even their blood glucose level was high, normal is below 100, and their hemoglobin A1c is 5.9, which makes them pre-diabetic. So these two results came back, a high value for the hemoglobin A1c, which is a simple uh, blood test, simple prick of the finger, 
Um, they actually sell them in, in uh, some of the drugstores here in the United States as a home kit. You can do your own hemoglobin A1C, but they also did a blood glucose level and it was high. So this was confirmation of the calcifications that we saw in this patient. All right, so next case. This is an interesting case. This is a expert witness case. This patient, for some reason, wanted tooth number uh, 19 out or 236. And uh, this case was very interesting to follow. The gentleman who was treating uh, this, this patient did the extraction at the patient's request. It was a difficult one. There were root tips that, that were retained. She had post-operative problems and she developed a post-operative osteomyelitis. He took additional radiographs which showed that she it really doesn't look like an osteomyelitis, but based on about the third visit that uh, was done, uh, I, this, the dentist decided to send her to the oral maxillofacial surgeon to evaluate. Well, the oral maxillofacial surgeon, of course, did a comb beam. He actually ordered conventional CT. You can see the reconstruction here, and there's that defect from the extraction. But it's only when we actually look more closely and look on the lingual surface in this surface rendering, we see the destruction. This looks like an osteomyelitis. And when we put that patient in the coronal plane of section looking at that view, you can see that this looks ugly, uh, ill-defined, and it's very consistent with an osteomyelitis. However, when I got the records for the case, I went through all of the surgical records because she went in uh, for treatment and was put on IV antibiotics and had all kinds of things done. And I looked at all of the, uh, the blood workup, you know, that came with the case. And in the family history, her uncle, her father's brother, had a history of diabetes. In her own close family history, you can see her brother was already diagnosed as a diabetic. And then digging into the actual serology, her blood glucose was 104. Well, that makes her pre-diabetic, okay? So pre-diabetes diabetes is in the 100 to 125 range with, they didn't do a, a hemoglobin A1C. But this case was basically settled because the opposing counsel didn't want to take it to court and have me say, well, the dentist isn't at fault. They did everything they did for standard of care. They just didn't have blood values because they weren't anticipating that the patient had diabetes or was about to get diabetes. And by the way, the patient didn't know that they were pre-diabetic. So, you know, that one is always going to get settled. Why do I think the distinction and the patterns are so important? Well, this is the, the world uh, uh, view of the burden of disease. Diabetes is the number four leading cause of death. Now, you don't see diabetes written on a death certificate. Death is cardiac event or, or you know, whatever the other problem is. But if, if diabetes were actually could be written off as a cause of death, it probably would be at least number two. And in the United States, it's number seven, okay? We, uh, worldwide cardiovascular disease, possibly related to diabetes, um, is number four. Um, it, the cardiovascular rather is number one. Here in North America, accidents, motor vehicle accidents are number one. So, but look at all, we, we all know this. There's retinopathy, there's, there's nephropathy with the kidneys involvement. Um, there's basically, you know, uh, all of the, the signs and symptoms and problems of diabetes that are related to cardiovascular events. So, this is not a, these are comorbid conditions, stroke and cardiovascular disease and chronic kidney disease. We need to do a better job of picking it up early and we can do it with comb beam and good software. So this is from a very, uh, a very well-known um, um, international journal on diabetes. And you can see that in 2017, their conclusion was that type two diabetes has a, a has a two to fourfold increase for the risk of a coronary event or ischemic stroke. So diabetics need to be diagnosed as early as possible. Uh, from the CDC and the Haines uh, studies, uh, these people reported uh, looking at all that data that um, basically diabetes continues to be a leading cause of blindness, end-stage renal disease, 
below the knee amputations, you know, non-traumatic, and that it is well known that it's the seventh leading cause of death in 2015. Well, guess what? It probably is higher up the list when you think about the comorbid uh, cardiovascular problems of hypertension uh, and, and uh, high blood pressure. So worldwide, 2017, if you total all of those numbers up for North America, South America, uh, you know, the, the Pan-Asian countries, the Middle Eastern, it's 352 million currently. And those are known, okay, pre-diabetic, known uh, uh, numbers for pre-diabetic uh, patients. That is uh, predicted to increase to half a billion or more by 2045. I won't be around, many of you won't either, but we need to do a good job diagnosing this. So my suggestion to all of you is that there are simple blood tests that can be performed in the United States. I have several periodontal clients that I read cases for, and they do, they do A1C testing right in their office. They know that diabetes uh, not under control is, is gonna wreak havoc with their periodontal treatment. A lot of periodontists are doing implants. They don't want the implants to fail in that patient. They do the surgery for the implants. So they do testing right in the office. There's actually an a American Dental Association CDT code for that, uh, D0411, as a matter of fact, and it's, it's reimbursable. So I think docs could be doing it in their office, but certainly you've got to be putting it on your reports and making it a recommendation that you do on a routine basis. So I believe that MAC is a diagnostic marker of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Medial arterial calcification in your cone beam scans is a diabetic until proven otherwise, either by phoning up or looking at the history or having uh, some serology, simple serology done. And these are the patterns you're looking for, circular, curvilinear, and linear. So how would the detection of this uh, help the patient? Well. Believe me, earlier diagnosis leads to earlier treatment. That's as true today as it was 100 years ago. You're gonna decrease the numbers of people that uh, lose their sight, that have neuropathy, um, that have cardiovascular or kidney disease and amputations. Overall, earlier treatment should lead to reduced healthcare costs and certainly for the patient themselves, improve their quality of life. Now, let me show you my frustration this is the recommendation that I made in this case, one of which was for diabetes. This is the what I embed. I embed two citations for MAC plus the picture showing why it's important. I have images in the report with arrows on them showing what we're talking about. This patient, this particular patient, was sent back to the physician with our report with all of these details in it and what did the patient do or the physician do? He ordered Doppler ultrasound of the cervical carotids. Well, that's not what we were talking about. You can't do Doppler ultrasound here, which is probably why he selected. And he was looking for the stenosis and blockage and whatever. So we have to educate our physician colleagues as well. You know, this is silly. Now, some good news on the horizon is that in 2012, there was a nice report done, a huge study done in China where they looked at the peripheral uh, uh, vessels down in the leg region and they did ultrasound and what they found was guess what they're not blockages but there is a pattern the pattern were linear calcifications along the vessel wall small sometimes long sometimes thick but very distinct so they weren't they didn't uncover blockages what they uncovered were uh, MAC in the arterial walls and they even gave it a grading system so you might even add to your referral, um, uh, they can do Doppler ultrasound in the, of the cervical components of the carotids, but the stenographer, sh or stenographer, the ultrasonographer should be looking for a different pattern of calcification. So just to kind of drive home my remarks, um, just from December last year to uh, the 1st of October, uh, 10th of October, <laughs> 10th of March this year, I found with four of my clients, 25 cases, okay, where I made the suggestion, I haven't got this completed yet, but where I made the suggestion based on the calcifications I saw that uh, they be, uh, it be ascertained whether they had diabetes or not. 
Well, you can see of the 25 that I found in, in all the cases I looked at, five were known diabetics, 17, okay, of 25. In fact, it's close. I think this patient had hypertension. So um, it, they're going to be uh, four of the five of those had hypertension, but 80, over 88% of these, the rest of these patients that had these calcifications had hypertension or high blood pressure or cardiovascular disease. So I know that in the group that's all this blue on here, that there are going to be diabetics that are walking around undiagnosed. So they need to have a hemoglobin A1C done and we're waiting for the results of that. All of these patients had MAC. So let's show you quickly some final examples. These are uh, axial circular pattern with and without MIP. This is the an earlier kind of appearance that you might see, but when you do the MIP, it becomes more distinct. Axially up, axially up in the salaturcica region, you'll see them in the groove in the sphenoid bone for the carotid artery. You'll see them along the length of the artery. Okay. Axially up here again, if you see it here, then look in the neck. Sagittally, you'll see outline. This is actually in a MIP image, but you'll see them oftentimes uh, thin lines that are kind of parallel and linear. And then when you thicken them out from this to a MIP image, you can see they thicken. Coronal, I think, is, is almost pathognomonic. When I see this, I'm already, the bells are ringing and I'm thinking diabetes. And when I do the MIP image, I often pick up, you know, additional portions of the internal carotid in that region that are involved. Sometimes it's as subtle as just a few linear calcified areas in the wall, kind of like the ultrasound. But following through, we actually see many more segments. So let me do one last case for you. Um, this is a case where if you were looking at this, uh, I, I made this up. I, I went too far forward in my reconstruction just so I could show you this uh, calcification. It looks like a diffuse sclerotic plaque. It's unilateral. Well, just to show you, uh, this is a full surface rendering still too far forward. It still kind of looks like a plaque. But if we turn it in a different orientation, this is the same patient with a curvilinear in the thin slice and a circular pattern in the MIP image. And you can see that they had other segments of the internal carotid involved. So this right here now looks linear in a thin slice coronal view. This looked like that big old diffuse sclerotic plaque. Here are other linear segments and curves in this patient. But this plaque is not a plaque. It's circular. It's a medial arterial calcification. We have to forgive those in the past, those people in the past that did all the studies on panoramics because it just wasn't the modality that was going to give you the truth. Um, a lot more plaques were, were basically, uh, quote, discovered or reported when a lot of it, especially in, in populations like our Indians here, the Pima Indians in Arizona, their incidence of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, is the highest in the world. And some of those studies were done on those Indians. So they had diabetes, not just arterial sclerosis. So it may not be a plaque, it may be MAC, and I want you to think about that. I want to very quickly show you, with the time that's left, I, I may be over, but I want to quickly try and show you um, how I get there. I'm going to open up the software that I have. And I've stored an, anon an anonymous case in this software. So um, I can show you quickly how the tools are used. I show you very quickly how simple the uh, tools are to get to the endpoint here. So as it's loading, uh, I'm kind of scrolling up to see where I can find the cervical components and you can see that in the neck region pretty low down in the volume data we can actually see a little circular portion that's the internal carotid and I'll take a picture of that I'll scroll a little bit higher up and you can see that we're picking up a little calcification here as well 
Now I will apply the MIP tool that's going in here, selecting MIP, selecting the thickness for 10, say OK, and now it's much more distinct. So I'll take a picture of that. As I scroll further down again, you can see that now we're picking up more of the calcification in the wall. So let's change that to the coronal section, and lo and behold, you can see in the MIP view, up in the clinoid process area, you can see a curvilinear pattern here and here and maybe in here. We'll go back to the thinner segments, and you can see a kind of a nice circular pattern or curvilinear pattern at least here, here, and here. So we have segments of these that very simply by thickening the slice and applying the tool we can actually see the components and there we are a big calcification in the internal carotid here and another one or two where the carotid comes up and bends forward and that's at one millimeter so that's how simple it is to do. I would put these all in a report. I would make the recommendation to do the serologic levels of hemoglobin A1C. Thank you very much. I want to, uh, to, to uh, entertain any questions with the limited time that we have left. Thanks again. So uh, again, thank you. I uh, can't thank you enough for the opportunity to present. I did figure out uh, when I was here before, it was the 10th Congress of the IADMFR and it was held in Seoul, Korea and it was 1994. So um, it's been a while. Uh, I've enjoyed uh, presenting to you virtually, but I'm hoping that I get to present this to you in person. Thanks again. I'll take any questions. Thank you.